Nathaniel Hawthorne, born in 1804 at Salem, Massachusetts, a New England town infamous for its witch trials of 1692. Born in this guilt-haunted place, Hawthorne himself grew up, in a sense, very much haunted by the same events, 112 years before he was born. For a few brief periods, Hawthorne got away from Salem, a period in his adolescent years spent in Maine, his time at Bowdoin College, and a few months when he lived at the experimental uh, Brook Farm, and three honeymoon years with his new bride, Sophia, in Concord, Massachusetts. But with these exceptions, Hawthorne spent 40 of his first 46 years in Salem. There is perhaps no more significant fact about this writer, who stands at the very center of the great literary flowering of New England at mid-century. Nathaniel Hawthorne absorbed the whole history of Salem, and before that, the history of the New England Puritans. He was entangled in this history because of his own family's participation in the Salem witchcraft trials. Hawthorne spent virtually his entire writing career struggling with his inheritance of guilt and human sin, translating these into the more familiar world of personal psychology, transforming them into the basis for literary art. From these impulses sprang some of the most powerful tales in American literature. Young Goodman Brown, The Birthmark, Rappuccini's Daughter, the minister's black veil, and the full-length romance, which perhaps has done more than any other work to create our image of the 17th century Puritan, The Scarlet Letter, one of a very carefully wrought work. Perhaps we might say of Hawthorne's works that they are fashionably overwrought. Hawthorne's writings are the fullest flowering yet of the American romance, the stuff of history itself rendered into characters and settings and scenes that are virtually purely symbol. And as symbolic works, Hawthorne's tales and romances have given rise to almost inexhaustible interpretations. Welcome to English 3350, a survey of American literature before the Civil War. We're in Studio 3 in the MD Anderson Library on the main campus of the University of Houston. I'm Barry Wood. And today we're beginning a look at Hawthorne that will occupy us for the next three classes, beginning today with two of his uh, earliest stories, The Birthmark and Rappuccini's Daughter. <coughs> Hawthorne was born in this house, 27 Union Street in Salem, July 4th, Independence Day, 1804. After the death of his father, a sea captain, when he was four years old, Hawthorne's mother moved her family, Nathaniel and his two sisters, to her own parents' home, the Manning family. At eight, uh, in 1813, at the age of nine, Hawthorne was injured, hit with a bat on his ankle, and this led to two years of convalescence. And during this period, ages nine to 11, he read a great deal. Now, this was probably the beginning of his formative um, formation as a writer. The records show that he read a lot of Shakespeare, the poet Spencer, the French romantic Rousseau, the English Puritan writer John Bunyan, and the essayist Montaigne. At the age of 12 in 1816, a purchase of property by one of the Manning family members in Maine, in Raymond, Maine, uh, on the shores of Lake Sebago, led to another move, the first for this young boy out of Salem. And um, for a year, at age 14, he lived in Maine and recorded these as the happiest years of his life. Then from 1821 to 1825, that is ages 17 to 21, he was a student at Bowdoin College in Maine. 
not a distinguished student. He graduated in the middle of his class. Uh, but certainly, uh, these were years away from Salem, too. Hawthorne developed the, the desire to become a writer uh, very early in his life, and it was somewhat against the, uh, the family tradition. He, didn't, he chose not to follow his father to sea. Of course, his father's death at su such an early age left him really without uh, the influence of a father. He also rejected the traditional professional careers that would normally go with a college education, such as law, medicine, the ministry. And instead, he worked at his writing. For three years after um, his graduation, um, nothing was published. And then at age 24, in 1828, he published a novel called Fanshawe. This novel is uh, virtually unknown today. Not long after he published it, Hawthorne repudiated the book, persuaded all of his friends who had copies to, to burn them. And so complete was, his, was the destruction of this book that even his wife, Sophia, who, whom he had not yet met, he, it was several years before he met her, it was not until after Hawthorne's death that his wife even realized that he had written an early novel. It was never mentioned. He never mentioned it the rest of his, of his uh, life. It's, uh, and, and this is a, perhaps an interesting revelation of Hawthorne's character. He, he had secrets. He portrayed secrets, secrets of all kinds, secret love, secret guilt. Uh, in, his, in his writing, and he may even have had a few secrets which we only have hints and, and uh, gleams of even today. Through the early 1830s, Hawthorne began to publish tales. Main Outlet was a, a regular uh, instrument of, of new writers from 1827 to 1842 called The Token. It was an outlet for several writers who were then beginning. Uh, Lydia Child, the poet Longfellow, Harriet Beecher Stowe. These, of course, are years well before her publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And here, um, Hawthorne published most of his, uh, his early tales. And these, in 1837, were finally gathered in a work called Twice Told Tales. It was uh, published in 1837 and enlarged in 1842. And it certainly included some of his best known tales. I've listed here uh, two that are quite well known, The Maypole of Mary Mount and The Minister's Black Veil. The, uh, the Maypole of Mary Mount is, is not in the anthology, but it is a tale that uh, connects very closely with earlier work on this course. And it is a tale that, that appears in uh, many of the anthologies that are used for this course. I have a copy of Twice Told uh, Tales here, uh, a modern hardback edition. Um, it's a substantial. Uh, collection. This one runs to about 330 uh, um, pages and um, oh, probably includes 22 or 25 uh, tales. So this was a substantial collection of, of uh, works. Uh, to give you some idea of the size of the corpus of, of Hawthorne's tales, uh, we'll have here another uh, edition. This is, the, um, this is the Library of America edition. And uh, as you can see, this is, a, this is a, a much fatter work, probably an inch and a quarter in size. And this collects all of Hawthorne's tales. And here we find the, uh, this book running up to about 1,150 pages. So, um, and it includes the works in Twice Told Tales and also works in a couple of later collections 
uh, the the table of contents for uh, for this uh, oh, running 20 25 items per page uh, runs on to nearly four pages so he he produced a a very large number of tales and what we're looking at here uh, is just a um, a smattering of those. To come back, though, to that list on the screen, um, Twice Told Tales is certainly his most important early collection, and, uh, and then the, the other one that is of considerable importance is the 1846 volume, Mosses from an Old Manse, which contains those, those stories listed, plus, of course, another 20 or so. Uh, and I've, I've focused here on the tales that um, that we, we are looking at in the course. The uh, Maypole of Mary Mount, of, however, does need, it does deserve uh, a little bit of commentary. Um, as I said, it's not in our anthology, but it is in many anthologies. And uh, this illustrates a, an important point that we'll, we will run across again and again as we look at Hawthorne in the next two classes. He was intensely aware of history, colonial history, um, and of course he was living in the area where most of that history uh, had taken place in, in Massachusetts. And the Maypole of Mary Mount story is uh, clearly based on the incidents at Mount Wollaston uh, that uh, community just a little south of Boston, which was dubbed um, Marymount, if you'll recall, and uh, written up the story of that, the account of that written up and, and in our anthology by Thomas Morton in chapters in his work, uh, New English Canaan. And you may recall that that work was um, satiric particularly in its portrayal of, of uh, how upset the, the colonists at Plymouth, which was only eight miles away from Marymount, how upset they got at the proceedings at Marymount, the dances. The, Mar the Maypole, of course, is a springtime uh, ritual that goes back into early European uh, times. This is, this is folk practice that is really outside any of the mainstream religions. And uh, this sort of folk ritual uh, connected with the coming of spring and uh, uh, highly sexual in tone and, and symbolism, uh, this had gone on in Europe for centuries and had come with the colonists to uh, New England. And uh, given that the, the whole maypole uh, ritual is um, emphasizes emotion and dancing and so on, and given the fact that the surrounding Puritan communities were, s were so rigorous in their, let's say, rational and intellectual approach to life, uh, it's not surprising that there would be a conflict between uh, the sort of theological view that the uh, early Puritan communities had and this pagan practice that they saw Thomas Morton indulging in at uh, at Marymount. Well, Hawthorne's story is, is not, um, not very long, um, but it, um, it involves the, the, same basic, um, the same basic things that, that Morton is talking about, except that um, Hawthorne adds a level of fiction to it. He, uh, he has a, a maypole dance interrupted by the authorities and then there's a kind of conversion of, of the authorities over to an acceptance. There's just been a marriage of a young couple around the Maypole, and uh, it's a marriage ceremony, and there's a kind of repentance scene where this couple um, is, is allowed to escape scourging, and uh, they join the, uh, the Puritan community, and, and uh, their marriage goes forward. There's a kind of mix of history and uh, fiction, and this, uh, this certainly reveals exactly how Hawthorne worked in all of his works. He, he used, he was really, um, I suppose, our first really historical uh, 
novelist. Cooper, of course, was historical in the sense that he used a setting, uh, uh, historical settings, for instance, the French and Indian War in the last of the Mohicans and, and so on. But Hawthorne is historical in a more rigorous way in that he um, often uses specific incidents from history which can be documented elsewhere. And uh, we will certainly see this with the Scarlet Letter, too. And then, uh, and he uses, Hawthorne often uses real historical characters in his fiction, but he still transforms history with, with a kind of fictional overlay so that uh, the, the historical characters and events that you find in his, in his tales seem to rise right out of history and take on an almost separate fictional form. And uh, of course, as with any good historical uh, fictionalist, it is not necessary to understand uh, or have be knowledgeable about the background history. Um, the good historical novelist always allows the reader to, to jump into the fiction and absorb it firsthand at that level without ever really knowing the background history. Of course, if you know the background history, um, it comes to life even more, but it's certainly not necessary. 1837, the year of twice told tales, is also the year that uh, Hawthorne met this young woman, Sophia Peabody. The, uh, the uh, Peabody family was um, from Salem, though you will perhaps uh, recall that her sister was uh, a member of uh, the Transcendentalist Club, which um, was meeting almost exactly at this time, had maybe been meeting for about a year in Concord, and uh, and the um, so there was a lot of connection between these people and other writers of the time. It was nearly five years before they married, and during this time, Hawthorne uh, worked for two years in the Boston Custom House. Uh, corresponding with uh, Sophia. And then he spent six or seven months at George Ripley's experimental community, which we know as Brook Farm. This was the transcendentalist uh, community. Hawthorne, of course, uh, working for the Custom House, was looking for more money than his writing would bring him. And in going to Brook Farm, he was looking for, per, for perhaps an atmosphere where he could pursue his uh, writing. But neither the govern, government appointment nor the Brook Farm residents were, were very satisfactory for uh, literary production. And so after a four-year courtship with Sophia, they married in 1842 and they moved to uh, Concord, Massachusetts, and most likely this was because of Sophia's sister um, being associated with the Transcendentalist Club and Concord being such a, a um, powerfully historical center of, of lit literature and so on in that period. Let's um, have a reminder here of, of uh, where Concord is relative to these other places. Uh, here we've got Boston, of course, the, the main community of the Massachusetts Bay um, Colony, and Cambridge, where Harvard University is located. Here's Mount Wollaston down here that we referred to a minute ago in connection with Marymount. Uh, not marked on this map, but uh, right down here, oh, just a little below the, the ITV logo, is uh, Plymouth. And uh, up here, Salem, site of the witchcraft uh, trials, actually Salem was, was, was founded a few years after Plymouth by the Plymouth uh, separatists, whereas these, these uh, communities in here, and many more of them, of course, up to a hundred or so in the 17th century, were founded by the Massachusetts Bay uh, people who came in 1629-1630. And uh, just about 15 to 20 miles in a north 
western direction from Boston, we have uh, Concord, which we've looked at in connection with, with Emerson. Uh, just to um, remind you of the size of, of Concord, um, quite a habitation. This, this is a, a map of uh, Concord in the 1830s. Um, with up here the uh, the bridge where where um, where the first fi uh, shot was uh, fired in the Revolutionary War in 1775. Down here we've got Emerson's house, uh, and over here uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, residence, where he moved the old manse, where he moved. Uh, with Sophia right after their marriage. Again, just to remind you of some of these things, there's the famous bridge where the shot was fired. And actually, just off the end of that bridge, there is, of course, the Minuteman uh, statue. And, of course, the, uh, the f most famous uh, writer at this time in 1842 is, of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who by this time has published Nature, given his, his American Scholar Address, his Divinity School Address. He's published his first volume of Essays in 1841, and uh, is, as, a, as I noted before, one of the most uh, frequently requested preachers all through New England at this time. And, uh, of course, Henry David Thoreau, whom we'll be looking at in a few classes, he's, he's a young man at this point, but, um, but he's certainly a presence in, um, in Concord. And uh, all of these are people that Hawthorne got to, to um, know. He, uh, he went ice skating, for instance, with Emerson on the Concord River. Uh, Hawthorne and Sophia uh, rode on the Concord River with in Thoreau's old boat. So there's a very close relationship between these people, and, and Concord was a place that you could probably walk from one side of it to the other in 15 or 20 minutes. And even today, if you walk around Concord, it's, it's a very compact little place. You could, you could walk from the Emerson house over to the old manse and then into the Colonial Inn and down to the Thoreau Lyceum and, and so on, sort of in, in a morning. So this is where um, they s set up house and specifically in this house, which is known as the old manse, this big home had been built um, by Emerson's father. Emerson's father, recall, was a Unitarian minister, and this is why it's called the manse. Um, it's where he lived, and it's where young Emerson lived in the very early years of his um, life. And here in this, this big house, which is a, a beautiful colonial house on a, oh, I would guess, um, a half acre of property, is one of the, uh, the places that you really uh, need to visit if you, go to, uh, if you go to Concord. There they set up a life of leisure while Hawthorne wrote, um, fishing and exploring and communing. And, and one night at sunset, they sat together in the study and um, Sophia dictated, and Hawthorne wrote, etching her words into a pane of glass where it survives today, where you can still, still see. And the words read, man's accidents are God's purposes. Sophia Hawthorne, 1843. Nathaniel Hawthorne, this is his study, 1843. And it was at sunset, they're looking out at, at the, the sun low in the sky and the, the trees, 
the smallest twigs the, the smallest twig leans clear against the sky. Um, almost a kind of haiku-like observation, like the first line of, of a, a poem. But of course, they're etching this on the glass, so they really can't be too verbose. Composed by my wife and written with her diamond. Inscribed by my husband at sunset, April 3rd, 1843, in the gold light. Signed, Sophia Hawthorne. Well, if one were to guess that Nathaniel Hawthorne and Sophia were happy, one would guess right. The three years that they lived in the old man's is certainly one of the happiest in his life, and uh, it, it's clear that this was, was one of the uh, happiest marriages of any of, of this group of writers of this period. Um, here, for instance, is something that Hawthorne wrote to Sophia. Nothing like our story was ever written or ever will be. For we shall not feel inclined to make public our confident. But if it could be told, methinks it would be such as the angels might delight to hear. During the three years that Nathaniel Hawthorne and Sophia Peabody lived at the Old Manse, 1842 to 1845, Hawthorne wrote some 20 tales. And if you've read any of them, you know that's a substantial feat because these tales typically, at, at the short end, they're 15 pages. They tend to run up as high as 30 or 35 pages. So these, these are not, there's a difference really between the tale as it's written in this period and what we call a short story, which tends to be quite a bit shorter uh, in our own time. And these uh, stories were then gathered together in 1847 with the highly appropriate title, Mosses from an Old Manse. One of the, um, and, and let me just uh, remind you again of, of those two volumes, we're, we're talking about the second of these now, Mosses from an Old Manse, contains young Goodman Brown and the birthmark and Rappuccini's daughter. Uh, the birthmark is certainly a story uh, that stands at the center of uh, Hawthorne's early tales. And this is a story of overreaching intellect. The presumptuous of a man, a scientist who tampers with life itself. Unsatisfied with the nearly perfect beauty of his young wife, he undertakes to remove the one flaw that she has, a crimson-colored birthmark on her left cheek. And in doing so, he achieves perfection, but that perfection is only apparent in her death. Now, the scientist is, is called Aylmer. He is portrayed in the story as a brilliant uh, young scientist. He's apparently locked himself up in his lab for years, and uh, his whole life has been scientific experimenting. One might almost suspect a, this has been a substitute for real life itself. He's apparently had some success, but he's He's frustrated by his inability to achieve scientifically some of the things that he would like to achieve. He's been unable to create life, and he's been unable to perform the transformations that he believes uh, science should allow him to do. There is a, a little of the hangover from medieval science here, the science of alchemy. Um, the alchemists in the medieval times were fascinated with the possibility of turning obese metals, for instance, into gold 
and there was an awful lot of energy spent with that sort of, of attempt to, uh, to transform matter from one form uh, to another. Aylmer then is one of Hawthorne's scientists and we'll see he's a kind of mad scientist. A good number of the scientists that you find in Hawthorne's fiction are mad scientists. And uh, the birthmark thus probably ought to be understood as an early example of science fiction. Now science fiction in our own time has uh, science fiction has tended to be defined by what we're familiar with in the 20th century. Most people thinking about science fiction will think about, oh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, who was behind the 2001 uh, story, or Isaac Asimov, the author of the, the Foundation trilogy back in the 50s, and, and many other works too, or Poole Anderson, uh, uh, those sorts of, of writers, and often uh, connected with space stories, space exploration, and, and so on. Science fiction in the last 30 or 40 years has, has often been defined in terms of space exploration and travel. And uh, you know, the Star Wars trilogy is, is simply in that whole cluster. But um, science fiction did exist in the 19th century, and while there were some science fiction stories, for instance, Jules Verne in the later part of the century, that did involve space travel, for instance, Jules Verne's story From the Earth to the Moon is an example, much science fiction in the early days was tangled with early scientific experiments and uh, just involved a whole different approach to science from what we are used to. Aylmer's sudden exit from the lab one day um, and his immediate finding of a wife and marrying her uh, might seem to signal that he's going to give up science now for some kind of more meaningful existence, but as soon as he's married Georgiana, then another problem arises, and that is the blemish on her cheek, her birthmark, and this becomes an immediate challenge to Aylmer and so he sets about to remove it and thus uh, create the perfection that he's dreamed about. In other words, he transfers his, des his scientific desire for perfection in his earlier experiments now to creating the perfect uh, woman. And uh, this, of course, is an attempt to, uh, to uh, gain control of a rather ultimate kind over uh, nature. In the story we find these words, we know not whether Aylmer possessed this degree of faith in man's ultimate control over nature. He had devoted himself, however, too unreservedly to scientific studies ever to be weaned from them by any second passion. His love for his young wife might prove the stronger of the two, but it can only be by intertwining itself with his love of science and uniting the, uniting the strength of the latter to its own. It's an interesting, um, it's, it's an interesting passage because it, it defines his uh, problem, his excessive devotion to scientific studies. It, um, it points out that he's not likely ever to give that up for any second passion. And one can't help feel with authors as careful as uh, Hawthorne is that the passion is uh, not deliberately chosen word. Uh, there's, there's a hint in this story that, that that's the problem for Aylmer, that he is such a rational, intellectual, scientifically minded person that he's not really able to give that up. And if he has passion in a kind of metaphorical sense for science, any sort of real passion from real life is not going to substitute for that. And um, thus, 
the, the, the whole passion for his wife and passion for science have to coexist. They become tangled together uh, in, in his life from, from this point on, and he sets about to create the perfection that he has longed for uh, in his early scientific studies. And he is clearly a, an obsessed man. Now, if Aylmer represents a kind of pure rational intellect, we could, I think, uh, say that his assistant, Aminadab, is um, a kind of opposite to Aylmer. And Aminadab is his servant, and he's a kind of faithful, animal-like creature, purely physical. So that we could say that, that what Aylmer lacks, this, this assistant has a kind of sense of the physical, and what the assistant lacks, Aylmer has uh, a rational sort of approach. And the two of them working together in the lab are, in a sense, like two incomplete men. Aylmer, all intellect, and Amanadab, all passion. And uh, one needs to note, for instance, the, 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 uh, the anima uh, root here in anim Aminadab's name um, is a kind of uh, irony because this, this means a kind of uh, mind, uh, anima sort of uh, suggestion, but that's distinctly what he seems to be lacking. In any case, the two of them as separate characters, almost as separate beings, help us to define Aylmer's flaw. And uh, his, his flaw is excessive intellect, excessive devotion to the rational, uh, which, uh, of course, is, is suggesting a view that Hawthorne himself may have had towards the scientific enterprise. Georgiana is probably best understood as a harmony of the physical and the spiritual, a woman of stunning and perfect beauty. And in that sense, she is of the same company as a lot of women that we've seen in Poe's works, uh, Ligeia, Annabelle Lee, uh, Eleonora. Uh, there's a pattern here. One of the most prominent elements in Romanticism is this quest for perfection, and in these two writers, particularly, you find this coming out in a quest for the perfect woman. Uh, of course, the perfection that someone like Aylmer aims at is really only a kind of idea, more an idea than a possibility. Remember that linguistic connection, Ligeia, idea. Georgiana, of course, has a flaw. It's visible on her cheek. It's a crimson birthmark. And with this, uh, Aylmer becomes obsessed. It begins as a simple mark, uncapitalized in the early part of the story, but it becomes capitalized as Aylmer becomes uh, fixated. Seeing her otherwise so perfect, he found this one defect grow more and more intolerable. It was the fatal flaw of humanity, which nature in one shape or another stamps ineffaceably on all her productions, either to imply that they are temporary and finite, or that their perfection must be wrought by toil and pain. Aylmer's somber imagination was not long in rendering the birthmark a frightful object. The, the, so the use of the words fatal flaw of humanity um, does have a kind of theological overtone, which we'll perhaps need to look at in a, in a few minutes. And of course, his, uh, the, the frightfulness of this whole thing that uh, Aylmer feels again suggests some kind of intimidation that he has before this, uh, this woman. Well, Georgiana is a weaker woman than many in Hawthorne, 
as we will see in looking at his writings, Hawthorne was particularly adept at getting inside the, the thoughts and feelings of women. Uh, this is a very compliant sort of woman. She's willing to go along with Hawthorne's obsessions and to do what he wants in order to win his love. And in this, she is a cast perhaps as a typical 19th century woman, but such analysis only works to a point. Um, like many of Hawthorne's wom women, and indeed many of Hawthorne's characters, she turns out to be almost a pure symbol. Now, considering this fatal flaw, the birthmark, Hawthorne's Puritan background uh, would make a kind of Christian interpretation seem appropriate. And in this sense, the birthmark as a fatal flaw uh, might very well be considered a, a symbol for man's sin, the, uh, the mark of Adam, original sin. And that's a tempting interpretation. It defines thus Aylmer's work as overreaching, trying to be like God, trying to remove man's sin is, is almost to be a kind of savior of humanity by removing human sin. And obviously, within such a theological framework, this is an impossibility. Now, we have to place ourselves back in the 19th century. Removing a birthmark in the 20th century is, is a, a kind of routine sort of, of business with modern surgical procedures, but in the 19th century, this would be regarded as something virtually impossible. There's a, an active science theme going on here. Uh, Hawthorne seems uh, equally interested in the whole business of, of the science of his day and, uh, and the assumption um, of course of science would be that the birthmark is a purely physical thing and therefore can be removed um, physically. But, of course, Hawthorne seems to be suggesting that, that that's Aylmer's fallacy in seeing it in such a narrow way. One uh, cannot feel that the birthmark is simply an ugly blemish to be removed. The reader sees, and Hawthorne is at great pains to show, that the birthmark has much deeper um, meanings. Now, um, as he's getting prepared to do this operation, we see him uh, demonstrating science to Georgiana. Here is one of the things, for instance, to soothe Georgiana, Aylmer now put in practice some of the light and playful secrets which science had taught him. Airy figures, absolutely bodiless ideas, and forms of insubstantial beauty came and danced before her. The illusion was almost perfect enough to warrant the belief that her husband possessed sway over the spiritual world. Now, if you have any sense of what's going on here, you, you probably suspect that these are visual tricks. Uh, here's another one. When she felt a wish to look forth from her seclusion, Immediately, as if her thoughts were answered, the procession of external existence flitted across a screen. The scenery and the figures of actual life were perfectly represented, but with that bewitching yet indescribable difference, which makes a picture, an image, or a shadow so much more attractive than the original. And one uh, final example. He proposed to take her portrait by a scientific process of his own invention. It was to be affected by rays of light striking upon a polished plate. Well now, none of these things were very unusual in Hawthorne's time when the story was written. But remember the story is placed in the early 18th century, about half a century early, earlier than this, and none of these things had been invented. But here are uh, three um, things that, that are involved in Aylmer's so-called science. One is the camera obscura. 
um, which is, is, you know, something that a child can, can uh, make today with a simple uh, box with a, a hole through it. Um, you could get a, a, the outer world to be, to go through, to, to be projected through that hole onto a screen behind in reverse order. It's the simple principle of, of, of light going through an aperture and focusing and so on. And this is understood for centuries. In fact, as far back as Aristotle, this was understood, and many writers through the ages have been aware of this principle. The diorama was actually demonstrated by Daguerre in 1822. The diorama is used very frequently now on stage plays. Wherever you have a picture, uh, a backdrop in, on a, in a stage play, or for that matter, television programs, backlit, a kind of translucent backdrop that is backlit, giving the, you the illusion of depth. Sometimes they use this in stage plays to create a window scene. It's really just a, a screen backlit, but it gives you this sense of, of that you're looking out into miles into the sky. That's a diorama, and first demonstrated in 1822. Um, the daguerreotype was a forerunner to uh, photography, and most of the pictures that we have looked at in this course have been daguerreotypes. This is a photography in which the image was burnt by acid into, onto a metal plate. And that had been invented in 1839 by Daguerre. And uh, there's also the stereoscope, which was an 1832 invention by uh, Sir Charles Wheatstone. Uh, these, these sorts of things are uh, what's really going on in this, this story. Visual uh, tricks. The birthmark, in its broadest sense, concerns the nature of life itself. Uh, 18th century science verged in many ways towards materialism and mechanism, partly because of the kinds of laws that were coming out in science. Um, the deists uh, portrayed in the, early, in the 18th century God as a kind of great mechanic. Locke's tabula rasa theory of, of experience writing on the blank slate of the mind was a kind of materialistic model of mind. Uh, the philosopher Thomas Hobbes had talked about mind as really just matter in motion. So through the 17th and 18th century, there was a kind of, a kind of stream of philosophy that was highly materialistic. The only thing that really mattered uh, was matter itself. And uh, so spirit in this sort of thinking was often looked at suspiciously, maybe as simply words for, for matter in a particular active state. And uh, this materialistic mechanistic stream in Western thought uh, has, of course, continued to some extent. I mean, such a monumental figure as Bertrand Russell, for instance, at the end of the 19th, the beginning of, and through into the 20th century, is, is an example. And the uh, continuing success of material uh, science, I mean, even our medicine today is principally a material business. I mean, pills and chemicals that we ingest and so on. All of these trends do, do tend to um, to present a kind of challenge to the whole idea of, of a, a spiritual realm. On the other hand, this is precisely what Romanticism is all about. It is a reaction against this. The idea of a spirit moving all through, through all things that we find in Wordsworth, or the intimations of immortality that we find in Wordsworth. Uh, Emerson's progress of the soul from material nature up towards spirit, all of these are uh, an attempt to, to answer in some way this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, crass materialism. Georgiana's birthmark is attuned to her emotions. And this is, I think, where Hawthorne puts the emphasis. When she is cool and rational, her skin is white. And the birthmark stands out as a flaw, which, if you think about it, is saying 
that a cool, rational approach to nature is what causes the flaw. When, however, she, um, when her emotions become heated, her skin takes on a blush and rises in color, and the birthmark ceases to be visible. It ceases to show itself as a flaw. Almost as if to say that in the full functioning of the emotional life, the flaw disappears. That appears to be what Hawthorne is, uh, is getting at in this, uh, in this symbolism. So, and as a symbol, the, the birthmark connects Georgiana's life with her heart rather than her head. And of course, this is precisely the problem for Aylmer, who is pure um, intellect. Um, there's there's a, uh, one passage that captures some of this. Had she been less beautiful, he might have felt his affection heightened by the prettiness of this mimic hand. Now vaguely portrayed, now lost, now stealing forth again and glimmering to and fro with every pulse of emotion that throbbed within her heart. Um, that he might have felt his affection heightened is an interesting suggestion. Again, there's a kind of sexual connotation here that, that he could have been aroused by this, but, uh, but he's not. Her emotion, rather than attracting him, becomes something uh, appalling for him. And uh, he has a dream, which is, of course, a forerunner of the actual outcome of the story. He had fancied himself with his servant Aminadab attempting an operation for the removal of the birthmark. But the deeper went the knife, the deeper sank the hand, until at length its tiny grasp appeared to have caught hold of Georgiana's heart. Whence, however, her husband was inexorably resolved to cut or wrench it away. There's some kind of fantasy going on here, an overreaching connected with science. And some commentators have, have uh, seen this whole picture of the operation plunging to her heart and so on in, in, in sexual tones too. Um, one might note the uh, contrast between Emerson and Hawthorne. Emerson's answer to the nature of life uh, growing one's physical life out of nature and converting experience into thought and idea. Uh, Emerson is all cool rationality. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. And uh, this is a distinct contrast to Hawthorne who associates um, meaning with the heart, with the vital life, with emotion, and with feeling. Emotion, of course, signifies life in relation to others, feeling that whole complex of vitality that is involved in human relationships. And, of course, in Aylmer's marriage, this vitality would be best expressed uh, th through the emotions of sexuality. Uh, the most profound interaction possible between human beings, but Aylmer seems to be a man most uh, inadequately prepared for, for that. And so what he administers turns out to be lethal, and the story ends with this commentary. Yet, had Aylmer reached a profounder wisdom, he need not thus have flung away the happiness which would have woven his mortal life of the self-same texture with the celestial. The momentary circumstance was too strong for him. He failed to look beyond the shadowy scope of time, and living once for all in eternity, to find the perfect future in the present. It's an interesting commentary. Rappuccini's daughter is um, also a, a, a very interesting um, story. 
Although the story is named for the daughter, Beatrice, it's, um, we never really get close to her, and the story is told through a third-person point of view, and sometimes an omniscient point of view, so that we really don't get into Beatrice's mind. Uh, what we do is, is we follow Giovanni in his quest for Beatrice and uh, his, his love and, and the outcome of that. Beatrice is the beautiful daughter of a doctor in Padua in Italy. Uh, his skill is well known all through the city. He's notorious for scientific achievement in the field of vegetable poisons. Beatrice lives with her father. She tends the, the garden. She's never left the premises. It's a kind of walled garden where she lives out her whole existence. And she is most often described in terms of flowers. Um, her skin is described as having a kind of ruddy bloom. And Rappuccini has specialized in poisonous plants and uh, he is reviled by his colleagues around the city because he has no concern for his patients. At the center of the garden is one big poisonous plant with blossoms. It's Beatrice's favorite. She spends a lot of time caring for it and pruning it, touching it, inhaling the poisonous fragments. And she has thus built up an immunity to the poison of this plant. And in the process, she herself has become poisonous. The isolation of this little family group of father and daughter is, is broken when uh, Giovanni, a young student, comes to the city of Padua to attend university, seeks lodgings, and ends up renting a room across the garden, this enclosed garden, from the Rappuccini household. And thus lodged in close proximity to Beatrice, he has ample opportunity to observe her and soon becomes enamored of her and fixated. And finally, they meet. Now, Giovanni has lots of warnings. Uh, when Beatrice, for instance, plucks a flower, a drop of the fluid from the flower falls on a lizard and it dies, indicating the, uh, the poisonous toxicity of the plant. Insects that Beatrice breathes on die. And when Giovanni uh, throws her a bouquet of fresh flowers, he sees the flowers begin to wither in her hands as she hurries away. So he has lots of warning about this woman. But there is a mutual attraction. From the beginning, uh, the, as, soon as, as soon as she lays eyes on him, she is attracted to him. Of course, we don't get many looks at him because the story is told through Giovanni's eyes, but he is portrayed as handsome with with classical features, as handsome in his own way as Beatrice, Beatrice is in her beauty. Well, the story proceeds when his landlady reveals that there is a secret entrance to the garden. Giovanni finds his way in and meets Beatrice, becomes the first of many visits, and, and they subsequently fall in love. Only once do they touch when Giovanni uh, goes to reach out for, to touch a plant, and she restrains him. And uh, he discovers that he has the red imprint of her hand and thumb on his. Uh, again, her, her poison. Rappuccini, her father, appears very happy uh, about the romance, interested in their welfare. The, the reason, of course, seems obvious. Uh, Giovanni's repeated visits to the garden mean that, that he is also absorbing poison and thus is becoming immune. And that would perhaps suggest immune also to Beatrice. In other words, he is becoming a 
a perfect mate for Beatrice. Giovanni's views, of course, are very different once he um, realizes that he too has become poisonous. He becomes intensely angry at Beatrice. And uh, in this, he seems to be much influenced by the fourth character in the book, and that is the, uh, the colleague uh, Baglioni. He's a professor at the university that he runs into three or four times in the story. It is from Baglioni that he learns much about Rappuccini and Rappuccini's reputation, um, and especially the professional opinion that people have of Rappuccini around the city of, uh, of Padua. He is, Rappuccini is seen as a ruthless uh, experimenter, immoral in his failure to consider his uh, patients, a man who places his science above all other concerns. The connection, of course, between Giovanni and Baglioni is that, uh, that Giovanni's father was a close friend of, of Baglioni. Once um, Giovanni assimilates this um, view of Rappuccini and once he falls in love with Beatrice, uh, he is angered and he feels himself to be one of the exploited victims of Rappuccini. Well, Baglioni supplies uh, Giovanni with a vial of antidote. And this is described as a kind of universal antidote, something that will work against all poisons. It will reverse the effect of the poison. And again, um, this, this sort of thing is perfectly logical. I mean, there are antidotes to all kinds of, of poisons, as, as we know. Realization, of course, comes to Beatrice. She seems to realize that she is poisonous to Giovanni when he gets angry. And when she begins, when she sees that his breath too will kill insects. And at that point, Beatrice suddenly recognizes the, the fatal science that her father has been practicing. She seems to, to accept it. And uh, she knows that she is poisonous to, to anyone else, but she doesn't seem to have any moral rejection of this idea in the early part of the story. It is not until she falls in love and, and sees that her poison has affected another human being that she, uh, she develops a, a sort of moral revulsion against her father. And um, she recognizes the isolation then that, that her father's science has created for both of them. Well, the antidote is ad administered, and uh, in her desperation to be cured, she reaches out for it and, and drinks it immediately. And at that point, um, Rappuccini enters the garden, and it's clear here in this passage, very near the end of the story, that he is very much in control. He, he sees that Beatrice is no longer alone. She and Giovanni can... Uh, marry. They are immune to each other. They will go through life dreadful to all others, of course. And, uh, and Beatrice sees that he has inflicted a kind of doom upon her with his experiments. Rappuccini, on the other hand, thinks he has given her and now Giovanni enormous power. He sees this in terms of the power that they now have over, over others. And uh, uh, Beatrice's answer to him is that she would have rather been loved than feared. Well, the antidote kills her, takes her from uh, Giovanni, and uh, leaves Giovanni alone, isolated, and toxic to the rest of the world. And Baglioni has the final speech of the tale in the last line, Rappuccini, Rappuccini, and is this the upshot of your experiment?
Now, I mentioned earlier, and I'll comment on it again, before the, the term short story became popular, the usual term was the tale. Most 19th century writers like Poe and Hawthorne and certainly Henry James wrote tales. And the term uh, short story, in fact, seems to have come into vogue after the Civil War. And those of you who register for 3351, American literature after the Civil War will soon discover that many of the works of short fiction are indeed quite short. Uh, oh, probably the limit of this is Kate Chopin's wonderful story, the story of an hour, which occupies little more than a page and a half. Uh, prior to the Civil War, it was much more common to, to, uh, to write these very long works of short fiction. In other words, they're short in the sense that they're not novels, but much longer, 20, 30, 40 pages. Uh, Rappuccini's daughter in, in a, you know, in a, in a paperback uh, text is, is 34 pages. Uh, the method in these is different. Rather than a forward driving plot, the tale unfolds in a much more leisurely um, fashion. In this story, for instance, a, a full 10 pages goes by. In other words, almost a third of the story goes by before any action occurs. I would take the action as beginning when, when uh, there is actually some contact first made between Giovanni and Beatrice, the throwing of the bouquet out the window. Up until that point, you have a kind of setting up of, of symbols, of background for the story. <coughs> Preparation for the, uh, the action. Now again, there's biblical symbolism operating in this, in this story. And it's a good starting um, point. Um, if you're astute, you've noticed that there may be some connection here with the Garden of Eden. And in fact, in the story, there are two places where that connection is, is made, one early in the story. Was this garden then the Eden of the present world? And this man with such a perception of harm in what his own hands caused to grow, was he the Adam? This, of course, is the omniscient narrator asking the question. And again, uh, later in the story, Beatrice, uh, in, as she is dying, says, I am going where the evil will pass away like a dream, like the fragrance of these poisonous flowers will no longer taint my breath among the flowers of Eden. I've uh, emphasized the words there, uh, underlined the words. They're not underlined in the original. We have at the center of this garden a ruined fountain which seems to embody some kind of immortal spirit. It gives life to everything in the garden. And one can't help thinking here of, of the river of life in the Garden of Eden. And the shrub in a vase at the center of the garden, which comes to figure most prominently in the story, uh, would suggest perhaps some kind of parody or opposite of the uh, tree of, of life. And with uh, these suggestions of a garden, a fountain, a tree, uh, it's perhaps worth considering the connections. Rappuccini himself is a kind of creator of the garden and uh, bears some analogy, therefore, to the biblical God. He tends the garden, and that's the view, actually, that, uh, that Giovanni first has of him as, as a kind of abstract sort of intellect uh, with unlimited power over his creation. Logically, then, we might think that Beatrice is a kind of Eve figure. Uh, Although there seems no uh, immediate connection of her poisonous nature with the biblical Eve, until we uh, look at the story perhaps as being a reinterpretation of the biblical story. Eve sinned by eating the forbidden fruit of the tree of life. Beatrice absorbs her poison from the big blossom plant at the center of the garden. And the sin that Eve committed is immediately spread to Adam. 
the poison that Beatrice absorbs is spread to Giovanni. And in the biblical story, it is the sin of Adam and Eve that, that, uh, that spreads throughout humanity symbolically as death. And of course, Hawthorne's story never gets that far, but that certainly is the threat, that if these two go out into the world, uh, people everywhere will, will die. Rappuccini then is a kind of rival god holding power over life and death. His garden is a kind of perverted paradise. And at the end when Rappuccini appears, it is as if he is a kind of god himself, blessing his newly created uh, man and woman. Uh, the figure of Rappuccini emerged from the portal and came slowly towards the marble fountain. As he drew near, the pale man of science seemed to gaze with a triumphant expression at the beautiful youth and maiden, satisfied with his success. He paused. His bent form grew erect with conscious power. He spread out his hands over them in the attitude of a father imploring a blessing upon uh, his children. The question is, um, what do we make of these biblical associations? Well, Hawthorne was certainly interested and concerned with the nature of sin and evil, and a major portion of his literary corpus resolves around these questions. We're certainly going to see that with the, the Scarlet Letter, which is very much about sin and evil. Uh, but here he seems to suggest that um, evil is part of the creation itself, and uh, not he, he moves it a little bit out of the theological framework. If um, Beatrice is Eve, her evil is part of her father's creation. Uh, theologically, Hawthorne's story would thus stand as a kind of accusation um, that God's creation is partly to blame for man's dilemma. For a God who would allow sin and evil in his creation is neither all-powerful nor benevolent, as Christian doctrine would imply. Of course, Rappuccini is a mad scientist, um, and he, the mad scientist is a character type in fiction, not only in Hawthorne, but the inventor of this was probably Mary Shelley, the wife of the English romantic poet Shelley. You'll recall Frankenstein was, um, was her work. And the mad scientist is always connected with esoteric knowledge, with a kind of monstrous tampering with nature. And mad scientists figure very prominently in these early works as in terms of horror. Uh, when they put their science to work, the results are often horrifying. There's also a kind of diabolic tradition going on here, uh, and that's an important um, thing to be aware of, too. Uh, the, uh, early in the story, we get the connection uh, made between this story and Dante, the young stranger, that is Giovanni, who, who was not unstudied in the great poem of his country. That can only be the, the inferno recollected that one of the ancestors of this family and perhaps an occupant of this very mansion had been pictured by Dante as a partaker of the immortal agonies of his inferno. The point um, being that the scientist is a kind of demonic figure, a kind of Faustian figure who has made a pact with evil and is really doing the devil's work in trying to, uh, to be like God. Well, Rappuccini then comes out to be a kind of satanic figure. He has isolated his daughter. He has aimed at giving her supreme power over others, which is what Faust wanted when he made his pact with the devil. He has manipulated her life. If anyone should happen to find a way to survive Beatrice's poison, that person, like Giovanni, will be similarly violated. His accomplishment of a scientific goal has ruled over his feelings as a father, and uh, the perfection of Beatrice is, of course, her death. 
Christian mythology is still strong in Hawthorne, but we see science starting up, and we also, in this period, the fairy tale was beginning. Hawthorne's birthmark is a kind of combination of Christian allegory, science fiction, and fairy tale, distinctly out of the realm of real life. Explorations into the unknown, the unknown in nature, and the unknown into the human heart. Well, have a good day. Thank you.